It's weird to look back on all those cartoons you watched as a kid and might have forgotten about years later. For me in my early days, when school got out the first thing I'd want to do was rush home, turn on my Sony TV set and watch some cartoons. As a small child growing up in the early 2000s, morning viewing for me consisted of shows like Arthur, Sagwa the Siamese Cat, The Wild Thornberries, Dragon Tales, George Shrinks, and once in a while, the original Sonic cartoons. Now a few years later, when I'd come home from school as a bit of an older adolescent, I'd pour myself a bowl of goldfish and tune into Spongebob, Looney Tunes, Courage the Cowardly Dog, Avatar the Last Airbender, and a bunch of other stuff. Well, looking back now, it staggers me at not only the sheer amount of original shows geared towards kids that were being produced by the big networks in those years, but how many of them I've forgotten over the years. I mean, the 90s through the 2000s was a great time for creatively fueled projects on television. And don't even get me started on the movies being produced at that time. Man, I miss those days. But recently, as 2020 wrapped up and life began to slowly get back to normal, I found myself thinking a lot about those formative years. For me, the memories still stand as some of my greatest, and in a lot of ways being an adult can't compare to my childhood and the freedom I possessed to do literally whatever I wanted to do when I wanted. In many ways, those experiences like going to summer camp and watching TV after school, Christmas mornings and birthday celebrations, they'll just never be the same. But there are some ways in which I can still enjoy things as much or even more than I did as a child. And one of those ways is through animation. Now, a lot of people find that when they're going back to their youth, they connect with the show almost more as an adult than they did when they were growing up. Part of this is because at an earlier age, it's sometimes hard to grasp all the concepts that the shows can throw at you, and when you come back as an adult, well, you see things you never would have noticed back then. The weird innuendos, the classic pop culture references, some of the humor, and even things like the animation quality and the influences of character design and plot narratives. And these things all tied into my experience watching some of the very quirky shows that were a labor of love by staff members who wanted a chance at telling their own original narrative grounded in cartoon millennium for years, but now starting to see a resurgence of fans in recent years. Some examples of this include Samurai Jack, the Powerpuff Girls, Scooby-Doo, and others that are getting new life pumped into them, with other IPs like a couple of my personal favorites, My Life as a Teenage Robot and The Adventures of Jackie Chan, yeah, remember that show, seeing possibilities of reintroduction into the world of circulating cartoons. And say what you will about how well some of these shows' follow-ups have gone, but one thing it reveals is just how many people are coming back with fond memories of the past and desiring to see more of their childhood emerge from the woodwork and greet them as new adults. And as one of those adults, I think the cartoons of the 90s and 2000s told a simpler story of creators who just wanted their chance at a good series, rather than trying to be the next big thing or lose themselves in a mess of social expectations and over-politicized dumpster fires. Now, this brings us to the 2010s, a decade of intense reckoning within the cartoon industry. On one hand, you have the looming mega-corporate soulless money-driven films of studios like Illumination Entertainment, and on the other, the unique, powerful, and influential, but expensive and aging Studio Ghibli. In between, well, there's a world of Eastern and Western animation we don't have time to cover today, but I'll probably try to tackle it at some point in the future. And those are just the movie studios. But what we're here to talk about today is the cartoons, specifically one cartoon. Now, I was largely out of the quote-unquote cartoon-watching phase in the 2010s, with the exception of Japanese anime. Shows like Adventure Time, Regular Show, Gravity Falls, and Shouter came out at the tail end of my childhood years, marking a shift in what I watched. This was until 2020. In 2020, the world was grounded, and so was I, trying to cope with sleepless nights and anxiety through the roof. During this time, my years of enjoying gritty, dark dramas began to kind of subside, leading to a resurgence of something I had not experienced in many years, comedy. I had long left comedy behind as my favorite form of entertainment in the 2010s, but in a time as depressing as lockdown, I felt I, and probably countless others, needed it more than ever. So I sat down in front of my computer, found a few YouTube videos, and began thinking about the old shows, the ones I had watched as a kid, 
those ones I waited so eagerly to watch after school. And the first instance of this came when I watched my life as a teenage robot. I don't really remember if I even watched the show as a kid to be honest, but even if I had, I don't think I'd have enjoyed it as much as I did watching it as a 22 year old. Now, that sounds silly of course, but I love the 50s aesthetic of the show, I found Jenny's character to be funny yet kinda charming, and despite some gross out humor and surprisingly dark episodes like that body snatching one is one of my favorite episodes, but seeing it as a kid, oof. Anyway, despite all that, I really enjoyed the series as a whole. But of course, the most recent example of this cartoon renaissance I've had is with a little Disney property called Star vs. the Forces of Evil, a series that balanced quirky and heartfelt brilliantly for a while. Now, I first encountered this series created by Darren Nefsey after stumbling on a lot of pins of Star Butterfly on Pinterest, of all things. I honestly just kind of thought her character design was pretty cool. I had grown used to seeing anime styles over the past 10 years, so it was kind of refreshing to see Western cartoons that sparked a feeling of intrigue with a single look. In any case, I decided to check out the first episode because, eh, why not, and found it to be quite enjoyable. The dynamic between Star and Marco Diaz is a good one in the first season. And I say the first season because, as I would learn, the show gets quite strange from here. But don't you worry, we'll get there. We will get there. What made the first season great was how it combined a relaxing narrative with good comedy, and some pretty interesting plot concepts, as well as many debunked tropes. Eden Share, I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it, she really hams up her performance as Star Butterfly, accentuating her weird goofball nature and undying optimism in the first season. And Marco is also fun, albeit he has a serious side and a love of martial arts. Other characters in the first season include the weirdly charming but very lazy Glosseric, Marco's love interest Jackie Lynn Thomas, Star's love interest this frickin' guy, Marco's lovable idiot friends, his funny and quirky clueless parents, Janna, the misfit, and Ludo, the other misfit, and also the quote-unquote force of evil in the first season. And what I love is that all of these characters are distinct and memorable, accentuated by their different color schemes, personality quirks, and how they play off of each other in the story. No trope or character I had seen was entirely new, but the way it was done in the show felt refreshing, helping to smooth out its early episodic nature. And that's the other thing, each episode of season 1 felt pretty easy to follow, but also had a place in the overall story. That story being, Star Butterfly is sent to live as an exchange student of sorts to the Diaz family home from the Kingdom of Muni. Not a super complex backstory, and it doesn't need to be. It's enough to be able to invest in the wacky weird adventures of our protagonists. And as is often the case with any quote unquote kid or coming of age tale, you get episodes where the characters learn lessons like how to live in a society or something else profound. It instead keeps the lessons to a minimum and it just likes to have fun. And because of that, I was having a super good time watching eagerly as Star and Marco became closer friends and their lives were intertwined. Oh, how that plotline got strange. But not here. Here it was really good and it left me with anticipation for the second season. So, season 1, 9 out of 10, good stuff, go watch it. Season 2. Now, Season 2 of Star vs. the Forces of Evil is really good. And I didn't get quite the fun out of it that I got in the first season, but what I did get was some pretty steamy plot lines rising up from below the surface. Mainly in the relationship between Star and Marco. Now, the episodic nature continues, and what makes the show great is that instead of completely changing everything, the writers just said, look, people liked the first season, let's just do more of that for a while before the narrative gets all bloated and overcomplicated and stuff. And this works. I liked how Ludo began to get some character development, and how the plotline with the separate wands was implemented. I liked how Tom began trying to get over his anger problems, I liked how Eclipse's plotline was introduced and added another layer to the butterfly line. This season had a lot of solid stuff, including probably my favorite episode, where Star and Marco compete in that huge King of the Hill match on Muni. And while I'm on the subject, I have to admit, I feel like River is 
literally just a mix between Nigel Thornberry and King Richard from Gallivant. But honestly, he's one of my favorite characters and is just absolutely hilarious. And I liked how this story, while not going full hog into it, managed to walk the line between light-hearted comedy and brooding drama, keeping it light with touches of darkness here and there, eventually culminating to Star confessing to Marco about how she likes him before going back to Muni after Glossaric's departure. I could really feel the anticipation ramping up and found myself way more interested in this cartoon than I honestly thought I'd ever be. Overall, this season is, as I stated earlier, really good. 8 out of 10, still recommended. It's the next season where the cracks really start to show, but we'll get there. Cue the music! So, Season 3 of Star vs. the Forces of Evil does what a lot of shows do in the second season. Take one of my favorite Sanrio properties, for example, a Gretzko. Season 1 focuses around the melancholy yet chaotic life of unhappy Japanese corporate worker Retsuko, each episode displaying a different aspect of her misery and how things are difficult for her. However, Season 2 takes this episodic resetting plotline and opts to make it continuous, instead choosing to show Retsuko as she goes from one episode to another, having one overarching plot instead of various ones that close with each new mini-story. And the same can be said for Star vs. the Forces of Evil's third season. What was a new and different thing happening every episode begins to see one continuous thread woven in, creating a main narrative. And that narrative begins to have trouble figuring out whether it's an epic fantasy cartoon or a slice of life comedy cartoon. Okay, okay, let's be more specific. At this point in the story, Toffee, the new main villain, is basically controlling Ludo. This leads him to doing things like destroying the Book of Spells, which also destroys Glossaric as they are linked. And this half of the season was pretty damn good. They kept ramping it up. There was that subplot between the humans versus the monsters that was pretty interesting. And the viewers learned a lot more about Queen Moon, Eclipsa, and the lore of the world. I also really liked seeing all the magical High Commission getting together to fight, and was getting to know them pretty well at this point. So I was all set to buckle down and watch Toffee get defeated by the end of the season. But something happened. Toffee was defeated in episode 39, and I was surprised to learn that there was still, like, a lot of this season left. So, okay, no, that's, that's cool. More show to watch. Anyway, as things go, the rest of the season began as episodic again, which felt a bit familiar with the first season. I will admit, I thought the big disappearance of Glossaric when the Book of Spells was destroyed was well done. And then, and then he's just... He's just kind of back, like, like, hey, what's up, guys? Except he's not, because apparently he has amnesia, and then he suddenly doesn't have amnesia. He could just say the word Globgor for literally half a season. Like, that's the only thing he said. Globgor! 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 I, I really do feel like the writers just didn't know what the heck to do with him at this point in the story, as he just kind of becomes a pointless character for the rest of the show until literally the last episode of the fourth season. But hey, honestly, it's not a huge big deal, there's still the rest of the plot. And yeah, for a while the show tries to go back to its first season shenanigans, which honestly, I, I have to admit, it feels a little bit foreign considering these kids just defeated a massive enemy hellbent on destroying the whole world, but tonality was probably my only issue with this rebound strategy. I still enjoyed the hangouts and the easygoing vibe of the earlier seasons as kind of a cool off period. But then the Miss Heinous as the next major enemy plotline kicked in, and I was ready for that, except instead what we got was a lot of jumping around. And what I mean by that is that all consistency just kind of went out the window. But unlike the subsequent seasons, in Season 3 it felt like a main plot episode would air to defeat the major enemy, in this case Meteora, slash, Heinous. And then the next episode would be about Ponyhead being annoying again, or like that one about Marco getting a portrait for his little sister. I know that different sets of writers worked on creating and storyboarding each new episode, but never had the show felt so fractured in the story it was trying to tell. It seemed like there was a main plot that kept getting diverted by lighthearted filler episodes, that not only broke immersion, but often featured characters you didn't even really care about. 
or featured main characters like Star or Marco who instead of fighting a war are busy getting stuck in a photo booth for 12 minutes or so. That being said, this didn't happen for a ton of the season. For the most part, the story stayed coherent, though I'll always argue Meteora basically just, like, she actually, like, killed everybody. She, like, took their souls, and then she just got off scot-free, and honestly, she just shouldn't have, but whatever. At least this conflict wrapped up at the end of Season 3. Anyway, 7 out of 10. The graph is a straight hill at this point, and its narrative problems are snowballing big time. But I still like this season. It was alright. Oh boy, folks. Season 4. Here it is, the final act of Star vs. the Forces of Evil is basically like if you had a list of episodes and just played them at random. That's pretty much how I would describe it. Remember what I said about the tone being a bit kind of all over the place in the latter half of the previous season? Well, folks, they, uh, they were listening. This season takes it to a whole new level by just throwing all continuity out the freaking window. Narratively, this feels like the writers were greenlit for another season and didn't expect it, leading to them making really weird decisions, like creating a magical realm of ponies where everyone who goes there will just lose their memories and act like they're high on LSD and mushrooms all the time. Actually, was that from season 3? On honestly, at this point, I don't even remember. But we, we see this place with Star, and then we see it with that one episode with Star and her mom, Moon, and then with the whole gang near the end of the season. Why would you devote so many episodes to people getting high in a young adult cartoon? I honestly just can't even imagine. Anyway, there's also the episode called The Pony Head Show. Like, I don't know who was at the studio and said, Oh, let's make an episode about this hot mess of character. Look, okay, okay, I used to like Pony Head. Way back in season one, I liked Pony Head. But she's gotten just like way more selfish and way more annoying in every single season since then and with less reason to be there each time she shows up. Now, on the other hand, this season has a few things it does well. I like the humans and monsters beginning to get along a tiny bit plotline. I think it's cool and relevant. I like Tom's character a lot. Overall, he's gotten one of the best character arcs in the show, going from an annoying and angry teenager to a genuinely good guy and a good match for Star romantically. Yes, folks, you know I had to bring that up. While I won't spend too much time talking about shipping in this show and stuff like that... Okay, spoilers, I, I actually... I have quite a few things to say about that. I do feel this is a very blatant example of the characters kind of going in their romantic directions on their own before the authors just kind of went, Oh, wait, but I wanted Star and Marco to be a thing, and I wanted that to be canon. And then they forced it with a breakup episode, and that's that. Now, don't get me wrong, I've always rooted for Star and Marco to get together, but as a fan who has watched this show all the way through and seen everything there was for the characters, I genuinely do feel like there's some forced writing here, and in a season where all the other writing is generally unfocused. But for this one narrative progression that makes sense, aka Tom and Star being together, this is where they felt they had to swerve 90 degrees and change a few episodes before the end to make it another way. Like, why did you do the whole Blood Moon Curse episode or literally any of the Star and Tom being a couple for over 25 episodes straight things if it was just going to be cut loose right at the end? The fact that I never felt that they were going to break up and then they just kind of did at the beginning of an episode really seemed strange to me. Like, I said I'm not really angry about this, I just thought it didn't make sense. Anyway, I'll get back to that, but first I want to talk about the finale. So, sit back, relax, and let's talk about that for a moment, or two moments. So at this point, Star and company have defeated many, many enemies, and the latest threat is Mina. Little do we know, her army of angry civilians turned supernatural mob in gigantic night suits was actually given their power by Moon, as a way to leverage back the throne to her people, the Mumins. Now, as someone who actually thought that Eclipsa was a pretty bad queen for most of season 4, I do feel like she was getting a little bit better and giving a place for the monsters was a big part of that. The problem being the Mumins 
now feels she's given the best to the monsters, and the balance has shifted and left them angry. And I can see how the plot twist makes sense, Moon seeing her people suffer and trying to get the throne back to help them, but what didn't make sense was hiring Mina, a known crazy person, and giving her and the angry mob the power to destroy everything, including Moon and her family. Like, at what point was Moon like, oh, this is a good idea, I'll just take the throne back by force and recruit an army of magical racist nutjobs to do it. She never thought using Mina, I'll say it again, a crazy person, might backfire. She never thought that her daughter, Star, and anyone else might get hurt or even killed fighting Mina? And her army of... insane people? Like, it's not Game of Thrones Season 8 dumb characterization, but this is still a really stupid plan to get the throne back for a woman who thus far in the show has been written as very smart and calculated. And yes, I'll admit A, this is just a cartoon, and B, the plot twist did have the desired effect of me not expecting it, but saying it's just a cartoon ignores a lot of the really good ideas this show has had narrative-wise. And also, just because a plot twist is effective doesn't mean it necessarily makes any sense in context, and this one didn't, not really. And on that note, man, the writers were really trying to bring Moon down. They even wrote that she freed Globgor and then tried to frame that snake guy in Eclipsa, but like, I still like Moon's character. She just isn't evil, and trying to make her bad for a minute, it, it just doesn't really work. Also, getting back to the inserted love scene between Marco and Star, yep, just getting back to that. Like, I wish that had happened in Season 2 or something, but at this point it just felt weird. Like, the moment had passed, but the writers had to do it because they needed it to be canon. It was a very sudden romance rejuvenation, and she's calling him her boyfriend a few minutes later, and I don't know, man. It's just so rushed. They had like four whole seasons to develop this romance, squishing it into like the last two episodes on a dime kind of killed it for me. And it kind of made it seem like someone just hit Control Z on the Star Tom thing at the last minute. But hey, all things considered, I still love this show, and I have to admit that the ending was oddly satisfying. And it did leave a ton of questions but also kind of tied some things up in a very sloppy but heartfelt conclusion. So, the fourth season gets a 5.5 out of 10. If you watch the first three seasons, watch it if you want, I guess. I mean, I'm being harsh. It was okay, but... It was a huge disappointment after seasons 1, 2, and kind of even 3 to an extent. I feel like if the show had just kept their continuous storylines, didn't try to rekindle the episodic nature of the episodes, and didn't try to force, you know, this love romance thing at the end in the last couple of episodes, and just kind of went with the flow of where the show was naturally going to go, I think it would have turned out really well, and I think I would have loved all four seasons equally. I might have even liked seasons three and four even more because the show got more intense as the plot went on. Unfortunately, what happened was I think there was just a lot of fractured writing, and I'm not sure the creators of the show were 100% communicating with each other on what was going to happen in each episode, and as a result, it kind of just fell apart. And that's really unfortunate, because I really like this show. For me, it was like this. The first season took me less than a week to get through. Second season, around two weeks to finish. Third season, three weeks to a month. And fourth season, I just finished it after a period of over two months. And though I was busy throughout the year, it's really my level of engagement that determined how fast I watched these episodes. Never in Season 1 did I stop halfway through an episode and then just decide to come back to it a few days later because I just wasn't in the mood to watch it. Instead, I'd sit there and binge watch the show, but with Season 4, it was a genuine struggle to get through at points. And don't get me wrong, I still love this show. Hell, if I didn't care, I don't think I'd be making this video. But when you do care enough about something even as silly as a little cartoon, it just sucks to see it flounder with its own writing. You want it to succeed, and I would argue it kind of did, but I'd also say that I'm satisfied with four seasons. 
If they want to make a season 5, that's cool, go ahead. I'll definitely check it out. But as far as I'm concerned, Star vs. the Forces of Evil has a strong beginning, a decent middle, and a less than acceptable end. So, it's a 7 out of 10 series. And yes, go watch it if you haven't. It's still one of the best Western cartoons out there, and despite all the problems, this is definitely in my recommended list. Because at the end of the day, I still love this show. And it left me with that same special feeling I got as a kid, sitting down after school to watch TV. Anyway, do you like this series? Let me know in the comments below, and uh, thanks for watching. Feel wild.